my great pleasure to welcome you all and to introduce Hina Kowalski. This meeting is being recorded. Uh, Hinek is uh, a towering figure in the speech sciences and speech processing. Uh, he uh, has contributed to a variety of, of different areas within this broad domain. He's a fellow of everything there is to be a fellow of, <laughs> recipient of the highest honor of the ISCA. And uh, it's a real pleasure to have him with us today. One thing that I've learned about him from other people in the past three days, though, is that he's not just a, a towering scholar and scientist, but he's also a beloved uh, person. And I think that will shine through. In his Everybody would agree. Uh, so let us all welcome. Well, I can't believe that it's me. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, let me see if I can, if I'm such a capable person that. I can actually even start up this uh, talk. Okay. Apparently, yes. So, you know, I decided to, when I was thinking about what should I talk to you, I thought that I don't want to just give you uh, down. Uh, uh, <laughs> Think which uh, of the latest what we are doing, but more like I wanted to do the uh, survey of what I did and my group did and other people did what made me think in certain way. So you will see a lot of results which are going as far as back as to 80s, but don't be too disturbed. I'm only showing you results which I believe are still valid, at least to some extent. And also, you won't see probably many numbers, because if uh, uh, just showing the numbers, I always feel that people are hiding behind the numbers, rather than explaining why these numbers came from. So I try to limit the number of results in, in the talk and focus more on what is it that we are, we are working on, and also the main reason is why we are working on certain things. So we speak in order to be heard. Uh, of course, this is not me who is speaking, but this is Roman Jakobson, and you will see his picture very soon. So what the, the point is that uh, we learned how to speak based on what we know about the, or, uh, how our hearing is working. Because hearing was here for 200 million years since the, sp the species got out of the water and start using hearing in the air up to the, uh, up to the Homo sapiens here, who is pretty much just like us. The hearing had a plenty of time to evolve to, uh, in such a way that, is, uh, that it is capable of listening for things which matter for survival of species. But somewhere, as far as I know, I wasn't around, uh, neither were you, but somewhere around, uh, around the time of Homo sapiens, people supposedly decided that it may be a good idea to speak. And so there was about 200,000 years, uh, so uh, three orders of magnitude shorter time to evolve speech. And it evolved to the point where we have, this is a picture of uh, Roman Jakobson, he said exactly what I was telling you. We speak in order to be heard and needs to be heard in order to be understood. So I, my point is that when we are using speech and when we are looking at speech, when we are using speech, we should be using some of the properties of human hearing. But even more, the point of this talk is that when we start looking at the speech, we will see the shadows of hearing. And we will see these shadows, which we actually are most likely should be using, because we will be seeing shadows which are actually useful for decoding of speech. So human speech evolved to fit properties of human hearing. If any of you doesn't believe that or wants to argue, this is the time to do it. So this is the first, uh, first statement which I want to make. By the way, if somebody wants any questions, uh, to ask any questions during the talk, feel entirely free to do so. 
I probably have either too much material or too little material. It's very difficult to estimate it based on the audience. But we can slow down the presentation to the point that I won't even be covering everything. Towards the end, there will be a lot of engineering, so a lot, some engineering. So if we can always jump that as long as we get to the introduction, which is here. So talking about hearing, again, I mean, anybody who works on hearing probably knows more than I do. But for us, just to put ourselves on the same platform, we all should know one thing. Purpose of periphery of hearing is to take the signal and put it into different frequency channels. It's not necessarily to estimate the spectrum of speech. It's just putting things in different frequency channels. And these frequency channels are, are carried all the way up to the auditory cortex. And you may ask yourself, why is that? I mean, if, some, if nature does something, it's probably on purpose, because otherwise the species wouldn't survive. So why is it that these channels which are being created in the periphery, in the ear, are carried all the way to the point where possibly may start uh, processing some of some important things which happened in auditory system. So, uh, so it is because I believe that this, uh, the division in the periphery actually is very important and is a key to our to robustness of processing in, in, in the nature and human processing. How, I mean, my first argument, so now I only have to show you that there is some basis on, on believing that or supporting that. One very good, very reasonable support is existence of, of, of critical bands. This is known since 1940 from experiments at Harvey Fletcher and by laboratories, and simultaneous masking tells you that. If you have a tone, and you, and you set up the threshold, here is the threshold, the blue thing, such that it's just, you start, just start hearing it. If you put a noise around it, you stop hearing it because it's being masked. So you have to make the tone higher in order to get across the thresh mask threshold. So you will just put out where it is uh, where, with the masking. You put a more noise, then of course what to ex you can expect that you, there is a more masking so you have to make the tone even st stronger in order to be heard over the, this raised, raised mask uh, threshold. Up to the point, because there will be a point when more noise putting into the system doesn't really matter with respect to detection of this tone within the critical band. And that was the very important discovery. Because no matter how broad the uh, noise is, in the first approximation, it doesn't matter. So beyond the critical band, these things are not being masked. Critical bands are narrow, uh, uh, lower frequencies, and they are getting broader and broader towards higher frequencies. So what it says, what happens outside the critical band doesn't affect the coding of the signal inside the critical band. And it took me, quite honestly, quite some time to realize that this is what this experiment is telling you. Because it's telling you that there is a possibility that some noises which are present uh, in the environment may, may, no affect, may not affect the things which are happening in other part of the spectrum. This part is so exciting that I believe that we should think about it more. Because that is, a, that is a key to robustness of distortions in the frequency. There is another masking which, is, uh, in, which exists, uh, it's known much shorter time, so early 80s, is masking in time. If you have a masker and it's followed by a signal, Again, the signal gets masked, but it progressively is being less and less masked as you are increasing delta T as the mas between the masker and, and the probe at the signal. And eventually, it, it cannot last forever. Eventually, it dies off, and it's after about 200 milliseconds. This is independent of how strong the masker is. If you make the masker stronger, mas there is more masking, but it also decays faster. So after 200 milliseconds, your system is clean with respect to the effect of this, this masking in time. So it says that there is some buffer in our human hearing, and whatever happens inside the buffer interacts, but whatever happens outside the buffer doesn't interact. So it's almost carbon copy of what's happening in a frequency, but this time it's happening in time. So we have a, 
So for critical bands, which are very well known, we all use them in form of the male spectrum for various reasons. Male spectrum is not the best thing to do, but, uh, but it's good enough for us as an engineers. But there is also masking in time, and very often we forget that this is also telling us a lot of things. It's also related to another thing which is well known since the uh, first half of the 20th century, which is human sensitivity to modulations. We are most sensitive to changes which happen every 250 milliseconds, well, a period of 250 milliseconds. So, so if, you, if you modulate the speech or signal, basically if, if, uh, if, the, uh, if you are out of this important range, the effect of modulation is not so much hurt. We are most sensitive around here, known since the first quarter of the last century. And I believe it's related to existence of this buffer. And again, we can discuss about it because it happens that it is the, we are most sensitive when the whole period of the modulation falls right into this buffer. Okay, that much we need to know about hearing. And uh, in order to maybe for me to try to convince you that there is something uh, to it. Let's talk about the speech, which as I told you happened 200, 200 uh, thousand years later, some 200 million years from, uh, 200,000 years from, uh, from now. How do we speak? We learn to use the organs which are used for all, all of them for something else. They, all these organs are multi-purpose organs. I mean, we use the lips, we use the lungs, we use the velum, we use the tongue for things which are much more important, which is like eating, biting, and so on. But we learn how to use these organs for speaking. And not surprisingly, that we, uh, I will try to convince you that we learn to speak in order to hear it well. So give the credits to Roman Jakobson. This is another thing which engineers sometimes keep forgetting. We believe that information in speech is in a spectrum of speech. This is something which was said in 1940. Homer Dudley was the guy who, at Bell Laboratories, he was designing vocoders and stuff like that, and I believe very smart one. He said something else. He never, if you read these papers, you never read anything about the spectral envelope or spectrum of speech. But what you hear about is that messages ch carried in changes in the vocal tract shape, which modulate spectral components of speech. So he says, message is carried in movements of the vocal tract. It's almost secondary how do you excite the, the, the tract. And it has not, well, only secondary effect is that the spectrum is changing. But the important thing is that amplitude modulation in, at each frequency is changing. How it is changing, we have to look a little bit into speech production, but not much. Here we, no, sorry, here first I, I want to convince you, this is a slide which I picked up somewhere. The, the Sri Ram Ganapati did it for me when he was my graduate student, he, which should convince you that what really matters is the vocal tract, changes in vocal tract shape and not changes in the source. Here we have a speech. Of course it doesn't speak, that's why I should it, right? Anyways, I tell you what it is. It's a Jim Glass saying something. Ian, this is a real shame that it doesn't, because we just checked it, right? Let me see. OK. So we, here we have basically the, the, the contribution of the vocal tract shape and source. And you, if you listen to it, you will be convinced, as I hope, that you, clearly when we look at the, vo at the spectral envelope being excited by the white noise, you would understand perfectly what Jim Glass is saying. If you listen to the source, at best you can, you can tell that it's a male or female. And I'd be happy to play it later. So we agree that what matters is how the vocal tract changes its shape, because that's where the information about the message is. What happens if you change the tract shape? I need this for that. This is a simplified vocal tract. Here we have a lips. Here we have a glottis. And here we have a resonances where this tract resonates 500, 1500, 2500, and so on. Once you start putting constriction, then the resonances start changing. When you put a constriction at the lips, the all frequencies go down. Everybody, every phonetician knows that. But as you keep moving the constriction, 
The resonances keep changing, and what you see, they, all of them are changing. Of course, they follow certain rules, but what is important for us, that everything is changing. Yeah? So it's not such a thing. There are actually some special cases when nothing, at least some of them are not changing, and the constriction is happening right in the middle of the track. But other than that, they follow the changes. My point is that then any track shape is carried, the information about track shape is carried in all frequencies of the speech spectrum. So what happens in, during speech production, you start with some idea what you want to do. The motor control controls the certain parts, important articulators, tongue, lips, velum. Then that these movements are then transformed into movements of all the whole vocal tract, and this tract shape is carried at all frequencies of the spectrum. Subsequently, people were looking into contributions uh, to speech intelligibility at different frequencies. This is a result of a long series of studies at the laboratories, for, which was carried about for about 40, 50 years. Conclusion was, if this is a spectrum, there are such a thing like a, the articulatory bands. Each articulatory band carry, has equal contribution to the intelligibility. And, then, and, uh, and if, you have, if you take uh, only half of these bands, about 10 of these bands, you still can compute uh, communicate very reasonably well. So if you, you can cut out the half of the spectrum, and still you can communicate, uh, communicate well in, a, in a normal situations in, con in a conversational speech. Contributions of each band are only related to signal-to-noise ratio in this band. If the SNR is uh, worse than 0 dB, this band can be kicked out, and actually is seem to be kicked, being kicked out in a human communication. If their signal-to-noise ratio is better than 30 decibels, the, the band contributes equally, and anything between uh, contributes approximately proportionally to the signal-to-noise ratio. So your intelligibility in bands depends on signal to no local signal-to-noise ratio. And as I told you, you can cut out half of the spectrum, and you can communicate it well. You can cut another half of the spectrum. You can communicate still reasonably well, because intelligibility in, on phoneme level is about 70%, which is enough for communicating uh, because of the redundancies, language redundancies in the, in the language. You can even cut out every second band, and everything seems to be doing well. So this is something which I learned about it some 20 years ago from my friend John Allen, actually. I got very excited, and I thought, we have to build a recognizers like this, because that makes our recognizers as robust as human speech. And I'm not saying that I succeeded yet, but we are, to one extent or another, we are working on it, and I show you what we did so far. Another thing which I want to mention is a co-articulation. Because as I showed you, when we are talking, speaking, then we are, the vocal tract is moving, but it's not moving very fast, because it's a mechanical system and it's a certain inertia. And so, so the dominant rate of change is about syllabic rate, about 4 or 5 hertz in uh, articulators. You can see it when you look at uh, recordings of the articulators, like in X-ray microbeam, or now they are on the num number of other methods look inside. This is from Srinarajan, uh, who gave me this uh, picture. So what, but what's the consequence of the co-articulation is that we are, not we are not seeing in the signal sequence of the sounds. We are sequ seeing sequence of the sound which is changing gradually. In spite of that, we hear sequences of sounds. So something is happening, which uh, is, again, interesting, which is what's happening in, inside uh, our cognitive system, that from the co-articulated speech, we are getting sequences of sounds. Most of speech recognition people tell you that speech co-articulation is a terrible thing to live with. I think that this is not true, because if you, if you are a human, uh, uh, human uh, uh, listener, or if you are a psychologist or studies uh, uh, perception of speech, you know that co-articulation can be very useful. This is, uh, these are examples of the res uh, research which showed up some, sometimes in uh, actually in the 70s, 80s for the first time. 
from Winifred Strange, and she was carrying this research further and further. I just pick up this one. What she was showing that if you if you play people the German vowels in this example, if you keep the whole whole vowel uh, whole syllable consonant vowel consonant, of course you get almost hundred percent accuracy. But if you cut out the silence and don't give any vowel there, you can still you can still recognize the vowel with about ninety percent accuracy. So you are you are. Uh, perceiving it from the co-articulated pattern from the neighboring consonants. Interestingly, if you keep the only, oh, sorry, if you only keep the vowel and cut out the co-articulated consonants, you are not as good as if, that if you are cutting out the vowel and keeping the consonants. So, you know, clearly the reason for co well, I believe the reasons for co-articulation is that we are spreading the information about the short segments of speech into larger segments, overlapping obviously, that allows us to produce the speech sounds with reasonable speed. That's why we can produce every 70, 80 milliseconds at least, uh, I mean, one sound, and uh, because they are overlapping. But information about what you are saying is carried in the larger patterns. And these patterns are re relatively, uh, relatively long, about a couple of hundred milliseconds spreading over the whole syllable. So this is what I want to. Uh, this is where I want to end up here. In message information about the message in speech is spread redundantly, in in a frequency because the changes of the vocal tract affect all the frequencies, and in time because of the articulation, because of the inertia of the vocal tract, information spreads, and clearly, I mean, this is done because we have a hearing, which is frequency selective. So if you put the information on different frequency bands, it's very likely that we can pick up at least part of the information. And also hearing has a very similar inertia, which is the inertia of the vocal tract, uh, because this is, you remember this 200 millisecond buffer I was telling you about. So the whole tract of co-articulation pattern, or main part of the co-articulation pattern fits into this, uh, into this uh, segment which hearing covers. So this is my way how I think that we might be communicating. And it's a hypothesis, because, uh, but, but we were showing some support for this hypothesis, but of course it's only hypothesis so far. We think about producing sequence of sounds. Those are these little things here. They go into vocal tract movements, because, because vocal tract inertia the information spreads, so these, these sounds are not coming out as a sequence of sounds, but a sequence of co-articulated patterns. These patterns spread in frequency, so these patterns are, the effect of these patterns is seen at all frequencies of the speech spectrum. This is what the co-articulated speech is. It goes through the channel, gets screwed up maybe, so it doesn't come out as nicely as, uh, as people produce it. But it's okay, because uh, we know what this is in the signal, so we create, this, uh, again, these spectral frequency bands. And we process them, not that I know exactly how, but maybe uh, there may be some, some uh, suggestions what we do. So what comes out are the sequence, approximate sequences of these sounds. They are better at some frequencies, not so good at other frequencies, because some of them are more corrupted than the others. But given what uh, our, our brain is capable, we have many, many, many of these uh, channels, uh, possibly millions. So hopefully some of them are left and uh, are good enough uh, to reconstruct the speech because then we fuse the information from good signal, uh, channels to get a sequence of sounds. And again, so, so a lot, lot of arm waving because how to fuse this how to pick up which channels are good and which are bad, which we should leave out and which we should use, is a mystery so far, at least a big par partial mystery to me. But I wish I knew how to do it because I think that we will have a truly robust uh, speech recognition. So if we look in speech and some applications in engineering, maybe we will see some support for my hypothesis. And of course, I picked up the, the experiments, uh, which I hope they are supporting it to some extent. 
For this, I will be, I will, I remind you one thing which we lived with for a long time together with Professor Stern, I hope, that we believe that putting some knowledge about human hearing into our systems actually can be good. And so because more knowledge we hardwire, less we need to learn. Learning, the amounts of data which we use for the learning are actually enormous nowadays. So of course we would like to do that. We would like to use a little bit less uh, data than, than, than we need for the training. And here I just t took a liberty to put a quote from my friend, the late Fred Jelinek, who always was quoted, oh, airplanes do not flap wings and you shouldn't be using this. And this is not true. He was saying something else. He said, of course, we should be using everything what we know, except that we need to know for sure. And Fred was a big believer in uh, data. So he said it has to be seen, supported by the data. Otherwise, don't go just to textbook and believe what textbook, textbook are telling you. Look at the data. So that's what we decided to do. Because speech data do not lie. Because we know that speech evolved on properties of human hearing, so properties of hearing have to be somehow reflected in the speech signal. And not only that, what we will see there in speech it are the properties of hearing which are important for the coding of speech. Because these are the ones which we should go for. Hearing can do many, many things which may not be used for, for the coding of speech. So I say some, this is a little bit of a joke. I mean, AI is getting so good that we feel, we feel that they are beating us everywhere. So the old wisdom of the smart people is if you can't beat them, join them. Maybe if, since we have such a good technology, perhaps we can use it for extracting the knowledge, which we can then use for building better systems. But I mean not just training the system, but extracting the knowledge which, can be, which is permanent and which can be reused in the next design. So that's what we are struggling for. So once we have this knowledge, of course, we can put it in. And we know which aspects of hearing are important. So these are the ones which we will be using. Here I have to apologize. A number of you might have seen this picture look, uh, many times because it's an old picture. And also it is a little bit uh, old fashioned technology from the last, middle of last century, which we are using, which is a linear discriminant analysis. We basically trying to find the best rotation which would preserve as much variability, as much discriminability in the vector space as we can possibly use. And the first question which we, are, we were asking was, how good is the speech spectrum for recognizing speech sounds? So what we did was we created a database where we cut a lot of short term spectra and we labeled each spectral slice with a label from which part of the speech is coming. So we get a big bag of short-term spectra, each of them labeled from the part of speech from where it came from, and we put it into, this is an ideal situation for LDA, so we put it into LDA, and we got spectra basis on which you should be projecting your short-term spectra in order to preserve as much variability as possible, and of course, LDA gives you the, uh, this uh, basis in, in uh, uh, order by eigenvalues, so they you also know which ones are the most important and which ones you can easily ignore. So here, here is the first four. And what you can also ask, what is it that you achieved? So you can say and you look how uh, do the spectral perturbation on this basis and ask, what is the sensitivity of this basis at different frequencies? So here we see it. The sensitivity is highest at the low frequencies as it's decreasing. And is this decreasing very much like the sensitivity of critical band filter bank is uh, decreasing. Blue line is the coming from the per perturbation analysis. Dashed line is a resolution of uh, critical band uh, analysis as uh, measured by looking at a bank of cri critical bands. So this was uh, happening in uh, 1998. This is what people do now. I mean, a lot of, a uh, number of experiments actually where, uh, where people were looking at optimal resolution of, uh, of the speech spectrum using the modern techniques, uh, deep neural nets. Here's one example. I think this is from, from Tara. And uh, here, this is a result which actually I picked. This is advertised uh, some work from Johns Hopkins. Uh, pretty much, I mean, we see the same thing. We see, uh, we, are, we are, are being asked to warp the spectrum along 
the, the, the principles which we see in a human, uh, in, a, in a critical band analysis. A number of other people I mentioned, mentioned here who did, who did the same thing. Effect of this is, again, I mean, this is something which probably you have seen many times. Effect of this, uh, using this auditory-like spectrum is that you smooth out a lot of differences between the speakers. Here we have an example of the speaker, uh, uh, adult speaker and a child saying the same thing. Again, trust me here, I won't be bothering even trying to sound, play the sounds. And here on the right side we see what happens if you put it through this auditory uh, processing. So you see that it's suddenly things be start becoming much smaller, uh, more similar, because not only that you smooth out the source, but you also smooth the, the clusters of formants, and that's exactly what ch children are trying to create if they want to create a speech which is similar to, to, to adults. So the, and human hearing is getting a very similar picture. So now we can ask an interesting thing, which is uh, wh where was I right when I said the information is spread at all frequencies? You can do mutual information, measure mutual information between the measure measurements in frequency and the labels. And what you get is that most for, over the most of the range, the, the information is about equal. So that's the reason why we can only take half of the spectrum and still claim that maybe we get enough information about speech sounds from the part of the spectrum, because information is spread at all frequencies. Again, I mean, I was for a long time hesitating, should I so show this old experiment, 1996, but I will, because what we try to do then, we try to see how well we can do if we use only one frequency band, two frequency bands, three frequency bands, up to seven frequency bands, and recognize its speech. So this is already engineering here, speech recognition. So what you can see, of course, if you use everything, the performance is good up to about four frequency bands. Four frequency bands out of seven is more than half of the spectrum cut out, and st still you are doing well. And only then, of course, I start, you start doing worse and worse. And it depends to, large, to, to a large extent, of course, which bands you are picking up, so in that way, this uh, whole theory of, um, of articulatory bands may not hold because it depends which, which bands you pick up. Because here we have the variability, right? I mean, but interesting thing is half of the frequencies you can cut out and you can still do well. And if you, you can even build a recognizer with that, which we did, of course. So we put all those bands together and fuse them with another neural net. So here we have a deep neural network in 1996, right? And, uh, and it was working quite well. As a matter of fact, it was even at the time it was working better than not doing it. So Sangeeta Tibrebala is now with, the, with, with, the, with the Intel, but I thought it was a very interesting result, and I wanted to show it to you. Okay, next, next time thing, next thing comes the co-articulation. These are the pictures from Visible Speech. This is a book which came out right after the uh, war, when people came up with the spectrograph. And that was a puzzle which was there, which was there for a long time, which is a co-articulation. This is a co-articulation of ki, a ka. And you can see that if you believe that uh, this consonant is here and vowel is here, so consonant ki is very different in front of the e than it's in front of a. Of course, there's some work from, uh, from uh, Haskins lab, even did a formal experiment with synthetic speech, and they were showing that a particular percept of k, basically, the frequencies are all over the, all over the place. The only thing which met, seemed to matter was that that burst of the consonantal burst happened uh, slightly lower, slightly below the main, slightly above the, 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 where the following vowel has the main concentration of the spectral energies. Of course, I mean, if you, this is some experiment which actually we did in my lab just for fun. We have a key and we have a ka, and we have this this uh, whole syllabi. Information in the whole syllabi is there. So remember what uh, some people were in my, reminding us that maybe information is in the whole syllable, even when we are interested in the sounds in the syllable. If you are looking at only at the individual uh, spectral slice, it's pretty confusing 
because what you do is you're looking at a pattern which is frozen in time. Here we have a pattern of, you couldn't tell what it is, but I show you what it is if you look, if you allow yourself to look in the time. There is a man who is walking there in the presence of the noise, right? But if you don't look at the whole thing, if you just, if you just uh, look at a frozen picture where there is only noise, you, you can't tell what it is. This is something which uh, Kozievnikov and Shistovich from St. Petersburg at the time Leningrad were reminding us. It's possible that we are still recognizing the whole, the, the phonemes. A lot of people say, well, in that case, we have to either recognize the whole syllabi or we can introduce some interesting uh, concepts like motor theory of speech and basically pretty complicated ideas how we, can, how we are decoding the speech. But if you allow yourself to look at the whole syllable, just like we allowed ourselves to look at the whole sequence of the, uh, of the walking uh, figure, maybe we can start seeing the information which we are interested in. So this is a copy really from the book, so you can look it up and again, 1964. What is the extent of coarticulation? You can measure it. That's what we actually played with it a long time ago, 1996, but this picture came from Katya Yegorova, who is a, a student at uh, Brno University of Technology. What, did she, what she did was she would take the TIMID database, or I think it was Wall Street Journal in this case. She knows where the center of the phoneme is, and then she would be moving away to the re uh, left and right, and she said, further I move from the center, bigger the, bigger the distance between one vector and the other vector is, the larger the distance will be. And she accumulated these distances over the whole database. So what she saw is that this gradually increasing cumulative distance as the delta between her, her measurements was increasing, was increasing up to the point. And this point is when the coarticulation patterns in, in average cease to be there because then suddenly you are already looking guaranteed to diff contribution from different speech sounds. So, and coarticulation is about a quarter of the second. Very similar to what the, the, our, our buffer in hearing, which I, I, buffer which I believe in, is there. So it means that as long as the hot rock coarticulation pattern is falling into the, the whole buffer, maybe that might be a way to decode the speech sounds in presence of the co-articulation. You can ask a different question. You can ask yourself, what is the mutual information between the measurements of the, cent of the, of the, uh, the, of the phoneme label and the shifted measurements in time? So you are essentially allowing yourself to look further and further away from the center of the sound, you see, see most of the information, of course, is in the center, but it keeps decreasing, decreasing, decreasing. And this is only single measurement, right? I mean, so, but still, it goes up to about 80 milliseconds to the left, or maybe 100, and 100 milliseconds, if you believe that, and 100 milliseconds to the right. So this is what Katya saw in her measurements, but this one is maybe more formal, more formal technique to do. If you allow yourself to do two measurements, you get the second measurement is here. So second measurement, it's telling you if I already have one measurement in time and I want to learn as much as possible about what's happening now, I should look into different phoneme, next phoneme, about 80 milliseconds away or 70 milliseconds away to the left and to the right. This is the blue curve. And, and both of them, both, if, uh, if you sort of look at both two measurements, here you see the quite nicely extent of the information in speech to the extent that we did the right thing. Since we have a LDA, we might as well try to use it on time uh, uh, trajectories. So what we take then, we take the te temporal trajectory and we label it with the label which is in the center of this trajectory. So again, we have the same thing. We get a bunch of vectors and each of vector has a label and we can feed it exactly into the same pro uh, MATLAB uh, uh, program which we did. Uh, uh, which we did before, except that now we get a FI, FIR filters, which should be used for filtering modulation, uh, the temporal trajectories of the spectral energies coming from our front end. Those are the modulation filters which we should be using. First four, here, here are the amounts of uh, uh, the, the discriminability explained. Here are the filters. So this is uh, it, uh, impulse responses, these are filter responses. You can see what's happening is that uh, 
the, the filters are suggesting pull pass everything what is uh, faster than one hertz and slower than about 10 hertz, but certainly suppress everything what is slower than one hertz because that's not where the speech information is because vocal tracks are moving. So if it is not moving, it's not useful. Filter it out. There probably is going to be some garbage like this background in, the fi in this uh, moving figure. And also safely filter out everything faster because this seems to be also not very useful for decoding of the message. So this is a linear technique, LDA. Here I have an example of another technique which, used, which is basically tried the same thing except using um, more modern techniques. To, in 40, to 15, uh, Honza Peshan from Brno did it with us. And again, you are getting rather similar filters. So the, always what it says is that dominant info, modulation frequencies in speech, you can also measure them. And the people at, at, uh, at uh, uh, University of Maryland did that. And you can see that independent of the uh, type of the material they use, they used to hear uh, uh, conversations, interviews for Buckeye, switchboard, audio books. All of these have the same profile. Basically, the speech is, module, is dominated by modulations which are ref, uh, reflecting the messages in speech. Here we have uh, examples for different languages. Again, I mean, these curves are so amazingly similar that it's almost hard to believe. And, of course, why they are so similar? Because that's where the human hearing is the most sensitive known since uh, Rees 1923. Here is a little experiment which we did in my lab where we got uh, with Nima Mesgarani and my student. Uh, 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 we got a lot of uh, uh, receptive fields from ferrets and we tried to derive the most important temporal components of these uh, receptive fields and it's, uh, the, the shapes are amazingly consistent. Uh, with uh, with uh, uh, psychophysical experiments. So essentially it says that to the extent that the experiment was done right, it says that transfer function of the auditory cortex is here and it passes components between 1 and 10, 15 hertz. Good thing is that if you remove these DCs, what you get, you can start, you, can, you may succeed in dealing with a lot of things which are annoying like linear, uh, linear distortions in speech. Here, this is an example which comes from the paper which I, I had with Rich. Rich knows it very well. This is a, this is a, 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 a syllable beat. This is syllable beat which is filtered by the filter which filters out, ex exactly filters out the frequency profile of the E. So you are getting beat which you, again, we don't have a sound here. But trust me, you can hear beat perfectly OK, because what you are doing is you are always comparing what's happening now to what happened around. And if you put a fixed linear distortion on the whole spectrum and it doesn't change, then you still, your hearing very reliably extracts the right uh, information. And if you use the spectral analysis which, uh, which ignores the DC and slow, a slow modulation frequency is less than one, one hertz, you see that the picture starts being, uh, look, start look exactly the same. It enhances the transition, the beginning of the sound, which is okay. This is what uh, typically every perceptual system does. But the uh, uh, main thing is for us engineers is that we got rid of effect of a different linear distortions. We became insensitive maybe to different microphones in this experiment. It was actually quite a successful thing. So more and more we start realizing what we really want to look at are the temporal trajectories. There was one experiment which happened in 1998, which I think was pretty it was also interesting. We start recognizing speech only from temporal trajectories. We took one second worth of the temporal trajectory energy and said, I will get information from that. So I we trained the neural nets on each of these trajectories, and then we fused the outputs from these, all these neural nets. And it worked reasonably well, and uh, it combined very nicely with the short-term spectra. So we were essentially building a poor man's receptive time, time frequency receptive fields 
And, uh, and, but the amazing thing was when the first time we saw it, that it worked actually even reasonably well, even without the short-term spectrum. Again, I mean, I just want to advertise this a little bit. If you, if, if, since you invited me, I, I might as well do it, right? So, so that was pretty, pretty actually advanced at the time, given the credit to Sangeeta Sharma on that. There was a hierarchical neural net, deep neural net at the time, or in 1998, well before when people started looking into that. And it definitely used independent processing at different localized different frequencies by parallel neural net estimators. And, then, and now, this is, a, I, you may say now we all do it, but of course, but that was 1998, so just bear that in mind. Good thing was that if we use this technique or this iteration on this technique on these problematic patterns of key and K, if you look at the result, I don't know how clearly you can see it. This is a K, this is a following vowel, this is a K, this is a following vowel. Of course, vowels are different, but K is always the same. It says if you look at the whole, whole syllable, you may be able to get the information about the, the first problematic K, regardless how this K looks like, because the information which is in, in neighboring co-articulated uh, sounds actually helps us to recognize the correct things. So I think it's a cute, cute nice little result. Not surprisingly, we start thinking about a number of things, and so maybe we will build uh, more complicated receptive fields from what we know. So these are diff we, we build the different re receptive fields this way, about 500 of them. We call it M rasta. For rasta is for religious reasons. M is multi rasta. And uh, for a while, it was quite popular technique. Actually, a uh, lot of uh, good work was done at, um, at uh, Aachen in, a, in a, uh, Hermann Ney's group because they used it for, for several years. They liked it a lot. It was working well. It works especially well if you build some complex uh, neural nets here, as we did at the time. Yeah. So clearly, what we wanted to do is to see what happens if we look at two-dimensional. Sorry, I, I think I'm, I'm a little bit ahead of myself. Yeah, yes. So we start looking at two-dimensional LDA. Instead of taking a temporal trajectory, so spectral trajectories, we took the whole two-dimensional pictures. And we, again, labeled it a bit with a label, which is in the center, and put it into LDA, LDA analysis. And here are the results. Most important thing is, yeah, we have, what we have seen is that it's still it's good to look over some interesting lengths of the time. This time is about 100, what was coming out from these things, what you see is about 100 millisecond. And most, most importantly, different patterns have a different distribution of the spectral energies. So you almost say it's, you take these different frequency channels, which Hinek is talking about, and put them together in various ways in order to get the number of descriptions of your, of your speech signal. And that's, that is being suggested by linear discriminant analysis. So if you want to preserve the, if you want to preserve the information about, uh, uh, about the nature of the speech sound, there, this is what you probably want to do with your time frequency patterns. Again, I mean, I can't help show that it's still true even in 21st century. Oh, let's see. This is a neural net which does the very similar thing. So it's a, instead of LDA, it's simple linear classifier, we have the whole complex deep neural net. But again, we are getting conceptually, basically, uh, qualitatively, the very similar result. Again, I mean, the, the, these patterns enhance the different frequencies differently. Each of them is different. And this is what we should be doing, feeding this, uh, these patterns into different nodes of the neural net in order to recognize the speech sounds. So not surprisingly, we start thinking about this multi-stream recognition of speech. And again, this is something which we talk about for a long time, and we still work on it on and off as the, uh, the funding agencies permit, uh, permit uh, uh, which is like, so take the signal, feed sufficiently segments, sufficiently long segments, of the signal auditory light spectrum in form the streets, streams. Mostly we are forming the streams by focusing on different frequencies. 
and then put in a block which we are working on quite a lot called performance monitoring, which figures out which combination is the best. So there is a feedback here in principle. So you try, you try different combinations and, and based on output from this performance monitor, you try to pick up the best combination and then you look at the results. Also, what we are doing here, what helped very much, and again, it follows the, uh, the philosophy, it's a, it's a stream dropping. Stream dropping, of course, is now used quite a lot, but this was done in 19, 1916, about two years or three years before Google came up with this uh, technique. And it was working very well because our classifier, then, uh, which, is, uh, which is fusing all these, information, these streams, are used on getting not a full set of the, of the frequency bands. So the performance monitor, which we are using a lot, and we still we use some kind of, uh, uh, some kind of uh, uh, dialects of it, is the following. We sort of took neural net, which was giving us estimates of the speed sounds, and we trained autoencoder on it, which learns how, what, what, how these patterns of estimated speech sounds should be looking like. What is the vector space of the outputs from the neural net? So you train this net on, a, on, the, on your, train this autoencoder on the output from the net which is applied to its training data. So we say this is the best thing you can ever do. And so whatever we see here is going to be good. We, will, we would like to repeat it. So if the new guy comes and you put in the test data, you look how well the onto encoder is recovery uh, the, uh, is uh, is uh, modeling this output from the neural net and and better the fit the better output it is that's what basically what we used as a criterion if the match is not very good we say obviously these patterns start being look very different because our auto encoder doesn't like it too much so here is the whole system we had a number of streams i believe we used seven and uh, there was this stream selection was based on performance monitoring, so in a feedback, feedback loop, loop, so we go from the output back to the, to the, to the input, which I, we think is sort of permissible, given what, what we know about the perceptual systems. That's what comes out, that these are the results. So this is, the, if you do nothing, you get about 12.5%. If you just do the streams, you get 11%, a little bit better, just like Sangeeta Sharma a long time ago. So if you do stream, drop, stream dropping, not surprisingly, you get actually quite a nice improvement. Yet another person, thank you very much, we take it. If you put in on performance monitoring, you get moderate improvement, but this is mainly because uh, our performance monitor is not perfect, because oracle selection would give us as, as good as 8%. But we don't have an oracle, we are not oracle, we can do it only when we do experiments, right? Okay, so we said, good. We said, let's forget all about the ways how we compute the short, uh, the, the short term features. Let's forget about the frame by frame analysis. This is anything, something which started to be used in the 70s. Long time ago, uh, because the spectrum is not very good, this is what George Miller was reminding us. You know, it's good that speech intelligibility doesn't resi does resist er erosion of frequency selectivity. For normal environments, plays a havoc with the speech spectrum. Let's go back to our dear people like uh, Homer Dudley and remind ourselves what they wanted to do with the speech if they want to display the speech. What they were doing, they would be looking at temporal trajectories of spectral energies, one fre frequency at a time, and they would get the spectrogram as a concatenation of different profiles, spectral profiles at different frequencies. We can do the same thing because we have a technique which came actually first came with Maria Satineos with Dan Ellis. Actually, first one it came from uh, from signal processing people from Rhode Island. So. We, we still always remind us they were first. But uh, where you, uh, instead of doing uh, linear prediction, autoregressive modeling on a, on a speech signal and getting the short term spectra here, so the spectrogram, you take a cosine transform of your signal and then you do the cosine uh, autoregressive model on the cosine transform of the speech signal. 
depending where you put your window, this, this is the part of the frequency range you are looking at. So your windows, instead of now working in time, they work in frequency, and you can shape them, it's just like auditory like filters. And, and you get another, another uh, posteriorgram, which actually, uh, another spectrogram based on these autoregressive models of temporal evolutions over spectral energies. Here is one, which is uh, coming from a very recent paper, which Samik Saru, my student, is working on that. So this is your signal, and what you see, what the auto, your autoregressive model is, is fitting is a squared Hilbert envelope of the signal. So it's telling you where the energy is high, where it is low. And what is very good is that those of you who know about autoregressive models, you can do a lot of things with that, because there is a number of transformations which we learned when people work, or with speech recognition people work on, on linear prediction, predictive model. So you can easily compute modulation spectra by the same recursion which we used to use for computing a capstrom of the all-pole model. The same, very same argument, uh, algorithm, but that allows you also to modify this, modu this, this uh, modulation spectra. So you can do things like what we suggested should be done, like leaving out the DC, leaving out the zeros, uh, modulation component, maybe first modulation component, and this actually is, I think, it's quite cute and neat uh, technique. So these are the spectrograms which we are. When we figured out the ways how to compute the whole spectrogram in, 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 uh, arbitrarily long by doing the windowing in time on um, on, the, on these signals and then concatenating it, so we, now we can really generate uh, features for the all end-to-end -end system of uh, Shinji, which of course we did here. This is uh, using Shinji's, uh, uh, Shinji's uh, um, uh, the software for recognizing speech. But what is a good thing is that actually it seems to be working reasonably well, right? For, on clean speech, well, we get about the same. A little bit, maybe here a little bit hit, here a little bit better. And oh, this is a clean speech, right? FDLP, maybe a little bit better, yeah. So this is uh, our base, ML baseline. We think that uh, the, the Guo and other people, they did a lot of other black magic, uh, which uh, we didn't want to use there. So we started with this. Usual trick is if you want to show the improvement, you start with as bad baseline as, uh, as, uh, as you can. So we started with worse baseline, but we can see the improvement. A nice improvement in the noise. Very nice improvement in bubble noise. When you start with the noisy speech, I mean, uh, here we have it. So uh, in this case, for some reason, our baseline was better. So you, know, you see, at least we uh, try to be honest. But we still see the improvement. We see the improvement on a single channel. This is, a ch I think, channel which was picking up the, the best, uh, best uh, channels. Uh, Shinji would know more details than I, I know, and Samik certainly would know more. And we hope that we can then help. The pa I think it's being inter integrated in a package which you have here, so please, if you, that, if you don't believe that I'm right or that I'm making it up, which is of course, well, I'm not trying to make it up, but I may not be right. Try it yourself, see if it works. Okay, speech recognition, 20th century. This is how we were doing speech. And a lot of the stuff which I was telling you about aimed at improving the features or techniques for this 20th century recognizers, the Caldi type of recognizers, right? Or ESPS or whatever you, the people like, right? Fortunately, I have a little bit of uh, uh, excuse because already in uh, 2011, well before people start using end-to-end -end systems, and so I was like saying, if you start following what I'm telling you here, use the use the this uh, temporal dynamics of the spectrum, maybe eventually. It might be that, uh, that uh, uh, constant articulation may be recognized as an important carrier of information in speech. Recognizing speech sounds without excessive use of top-down language modeling may become a respectable engineering endeavor. And human-like robustness to speech processing in the presence of reasonable signal de degradation may become a reality. So that was 2.11. Of course, in the meantime, they turned the tables under us. 
And again, I mean, since I have Shinji here, I have to mention that Shinji is one of the leaders in this, in this direction. I think that this is the right way to go, seriously. Forget all about these problems with the recognizing phonemes and co-articulating and using the three-state phonemes and context-dependent phonemes. Go directly for what you want, which is like maybe sequence of a linguistic message. And people do that, and of course, but in the meantime, our techniques are actually only mainly good as a historical technique which try to explain why we do what we do. And here I show this because Shinji is here. This is from one of his last papers. This is uh, attention in two heads. One head, one head is looking right there in the center of the, of, of the speech sounds. But the other hand is looking at a pretty significant context about a couple of hundred or uh, quarter of the second. Thank you very much. I mean, we are doing the right thing. And I, I, I was very happy to see this. How much time I have? Uh, should we, can I? Uh, yeah, did you have, so officially the class ends at 2.45. OK. Oh, boy. So give me two minutes. Yeah. Because if, since you invited me, I wanted to start with this, but I was worried that I will run out of time, and maybe I would look a little bit uh, obnoxious. I wanted to talk about Isaac Newton here and about his attempts on, uh, as alchemist. This is taken from his uh, notebook, and you see what alchemists were doing. They would just give you the prescription, and they would give you the result, which result was probably always was fake, because I don't think they could ever even Isaac Newton didn't make the gold. But he said, take some body fluids, make a stone out of it, boil it for 40 days, then boil it again for 40 days, and then you mix it with mercury and you will get the gold. And, but, so this was a, a Isaac Newton side, a alchemist. He believed that he can take things in the parts and put it back together as something else. Eventually he succeeded. That was actually one of his very important contributions. It wasn't only gravity, but also nature of light. So he managed to break the light into different frequency bands and put it back together. And he knew why he's doing it. So he suddenly from this alchemy, where he described what he was doing and what he might have been getting, he was also explaining why it was happening, because different colors have a different wavelengths. And you can break it if you put it through the prism. So here it is, right? Alchemy tells us what and how. Science tells us why. Look at the ASR speech researchers. I mean, if you look at these papers, and I speak to all of us, including ourselves, myself, of course, what we typically see, what we did, how we did it, and what, what is it that we received. Right? And so we try to, of course, just like the alchemists, we try to add a little bit of there, take away from a little bit there, we call it fine tuning, and then we report what we get. That was like Isaac Newton. I think that we should really start asking why certain techniques work. What is it that we learn about speech? For this, it may be really necessary to get report the results which are no good, set the, set the experiments where hypothesis is not I'm getting a better result, but hypothesis might be if I do this, I get a, not such a good result, or worse result. It's a, a totally a legal thing to do if you are learning about the nature of the problem. So anyway, sorry for this. Yeah, I think we, maybe you never know where we sort of get. Maybe it's not possible, but if we work hard, OK, this is a slide which I like to show to my funding agencies. Uh, but uh, this is uh, just joke, joke, right? So I, I wanted to end up on a on light thing. But if the one before that isn't so light. I truly believe that we, we are having too much of the how and what, not enough why. And if I can give some value to what we are doing for the past 20 years, I think that we know a little bit more why. We know a little bit more why we are now getting good results from feeding the whole utterance in a recognizer and trying to recognize the whole 
message without bothering with the co-articulations and, and, uh, and everything. So we know why. And we even know, this is something which we should talk with, with Shinji, why some of these attention heads are attend to, to, to a couple of hundred milliseconds. Okay. We, we probably have only three minutes, right? We have some time for questions. So please, we're open for questions now. Yes. So I have a question going back to near the beginning, where you're talking about uh, the important information in speech in the speech signal coming from the. Uh, configuration of the vocal tract. And I, I thought about tone languages at this point in time and also yes, intonation, yes, yes. where it seems like an important part of the signal is also coming from yes, the source, yes. from the yes. glottis. Yes. And so um, is, is that important or significant? I think so. I think so. Well, I should be careful, more careful and say, well, main bulk of information might be in the shape of the vocal tract and there is, uh, yeah, I wouldn't claim that prosody is not important. <laughs> Clearly it is. The, but, uh, or even the you know, changes in the pitch might carry the, some information. Primary source of information is uh, how the vocal tract modulates the carrier. But additional technique, uh, additional measurements, ob obviously, and, and I get this question almost always, I don't have any better answer than to say, yes, there are languages where they figure out that actually tone actually may be, be highly discriminative. Yeah, yeah. I wonder to what extent uh, you can see it in a spectral envelope, but I don't think so. I think that it's, a, for, you know, these tones, if, they, if, if you can get them uh, from, uh, this assumption that you are just measuring the ev temporal evolution of the spectral energy in time. I don't know. It would be good to know because I should have some answer because I feel a little bit bad because you are not, certainly not the first one to ask this when you, when you say that source is not important. Well, uh, certainly they but, are in yeah. the spectrum. Yeah. Right, just as but, the but certainly things like, so like voice, voice onset time and that sort of thing, uh, and uh, pos the position of the birth right. in a consonant or something, that's very questionable. And it seems like that if you abstract from that and start using a different uh, way of looking at speech, the problem is, is seem to be going at least to some extent away. But uh, tonal languages, yes. Thank you. No, well, I, I thank you for the question. As I said, I mean, it's uh, I feel a little bit bad because it's not first time people are asking. As I said, if I had more funding, probably I can answer. <laughs> <laughs> I can answer, <laughs> answer this question. <laughs> I would have. Yes? Hi, thank you so much for your, for your presentation. I'm fascinated by the way you compare all this Isaac and Newton of alchemy. And I, I wonder, what are some of the why questions that you have in your mind right now? And um, also, what do you think is missing from the field right now? So, well, my, I mean, I pretty much summarize my main things which sort of somehow are on my heart for past 20 years. So I still believe that uh, if we figure out how to recognize speech from many, many, many parallel streams, not necessarily simple streams as I was talking about, just like spectral energies, but what is happening like on the level of auditory cortex where you have myriads of, of active neurons, each of them different, and all of them seem to be providing one picture of the signal, how to pick up the good ones and how to ignore the bad ones. That is, I, I would love to do before I retire or uh, before I go away. But, uh, but uh, what, what I see, what we are working, I tell you what we are working on now, we are working on, 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 on the continual learning, like without forgetting, you know, the, the lifelong learning that people sometimes call it. Of course, using so we are working on these performance monitors because we need them to our approach to, uh, to continue, uh, continuous learning. Recently, I can't have not much to say yet about it. Is I also got involved in, in more funny things like uh, recognizing uh, 
brain signals, uh, speech from the, uh, from the signals from auditory cortex, but there's very little to do with that, except again, you have 128 channels, spatial channels, and information is there. And some of them have, have more, some of them have less, so we are using some of these techniques. But a lot of people were asking me today, what is it that they should be working on? I think that the main problem right now is the amounts of training data which we are using, so we managed to do a very good recognition of major languages, but uh, I know that a lot of people work on it here, so I speak to the, to the choir, is uh, adaptation, uh, use, dealing with minority languages, that uh, certainly get us far. Robustness, I hope that I didn't pretend that I solved everything here, mm, far from that. Robustness to noises, robustness to performance in reasonable environments, that's something which still we are not good. And so it's not that there is not enough work to do in, in uh, language technologies. <laughs> I tell my students if they get into it, they are guaranteed to retire with this problem if they are not careful enough and they don't go to Wall Street and finances <laughs> with their skills. So there's plenty to do. Yes. Uh, Mel filters are as good as they come. It's a, there's a reasonable approximation to spectral resolution properties of human hearing. I think that we are now using too many Mel filters, too, which are too narrow for my liking. I think that we should be still remembering what we are modeling in the first place, or we should be modeling is these critical bands, which critical bands are the bands within which things are mixing together and outside. It's not, I think the current way of using 80 filters or something, the filters become just extremely narrow. Or they don't have to. So if I were Professor Vetanabe, I would ask my students, try to use 80 filters, but make them much broader. Don't get them crossed in the middle, but remember that they initially people start using 20 of them, so look what shapes were, and you try to use them, because you can always put many, many more. I wonder what would happen, but I, I, I have no, no struggle with the male spectrum. As a matter of fact, I use male spectrum very often in arguments with people who claim that hearing is not important, because everybody uses it with, even without knowing. Because, you know, people, engineers use whatever works, and they are actually very, very good in it. So nobody would, nobody of the same mind would nowadays use the Fourier spectrum as an input. Because we you know that it, it doesn't work and the other thing works. And you don't have to necessarily be religious about it and claim, oh, I'm modeling hearing, but you do. At least this one very important aspect. You said something important, but I couldn't hear it. So, uh, the neural network learns the filter from itself. Uh -huh. so, do you think the future trend is that you trust the neural net to run the filter? If I get the same filters for all the data databases, I would use them. But I think what we are getting so far, we are just getting confirmation that auditory like resolution is good. And of course, you tune it, maybe if you train it on particular t problem, you tune it on particular problem. But as far as I know, I talk to my colleagues, it tends to be working not that well on another problem because it's already tuned, you know. So tuning is, it, tuning is a good thing if you need to deliver a good result. It's a dangerous thing if you don't want to say be scientist, if you want to really learn something. Because it, uh, it's, unless I see the result over and over and over again, then, uh, then I, I worry about anything too overtraining on a, on a task, on the training data. And uh, learning the fil filters on the task might be perhaps a little bit too much, I don't know. 
I don't know. But there are some good people working on that. You know, you have these sink filters, uh, very efficient ways of, of uh, uh, training. We tried it too. It works. But at the end, what you get, you get metal like metal like uh, resolution. Maybe maybe I'm just trying to sweep things under the carpet too much, but <laughs> but and that's what I, I feel. <laughs> well, I thank you because it was wonderful. Yeah, thank you.